You are listening to The Big Scuba. This is an audio-only episode. Hi, I'm Gemma Smith, and I'm here talking with Gemma and Ian about all things diving. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. This is episode 35. You are listening to The Big Scuba Podcast. And myself is Ian, and also online is Gemma. Hello, everyone. Hello. So, uh, yes, as we said, uh, this is episode 35, and this one is with our friend Gemma Smith. Yep, and she is based in the uh, Grand Cayman at the moment. We had, we had a good chat with Gemma and um, took a little bit of organising, getting things sorted out because she's like another half a world away from us, isn't she? You know, yep. and uh, so do excuse us if the uh, quality of Zoom do dip occasionally but you know it is what it is and uh, we are in this world of zooming as we are um, but welcome anyway and uh, we know we appreciate you dialing in and downloading this as always uh, if you do get a chance uh, we are also on the youtube channel in the name of the big scuba have a look on there lots of videos lots of bits and pieces that we've done uh, since we've been doing the whole podcast and uh, have a little, little look, see what we've been up to, and subscribe and hit the notification button. Yeah, and rather than hear our voices, you can actually see us. Yeah, see what we're up to. There's audio books on there um, of our previous guests. Um, also, us uh, diving and paddleboarding and kayaking. We've got our friends on there, Paul, Jody, and uh, Honey, Scuba Honey, she's on there, isn't she? So... Um, we're all on there, so uh, you can see all the characters of uh, the Big Scuba podcast. So, um, Gemma, what, what's, what's news? What's been happening? Well, we've got some diving to plan in, haven't we? And we have. Yep. <laughs> you sound almost surprised. <laughs> well, no, we've got to yeah, get some more diving in before the weather really we have, Hopefully, all being well, Friday, we should be getting some diving in with a bit of luck. Yeah, and we might get some testing done on a few new pieces of gear and equipment. Yeah, that's right. And um, we've been using the power lens, haven't we? Yeah. For, uh, as we mentioned on the last episode, for various things, kayak and paddleboard and, and even up a tree. Uh, there's <laughs> a little video coming out of that. thought we'd uh, raise it up aloft and see what it's like. Yeah. And that worked a tree. So that's quite Did it? Good. I've got a question. Did it? Yeah. Registered the height. It did. Yeah, it did. Oh. It was quite clever, wasn't it? Yeah. So I quite like that. And uh, I just thought I'd try it, see what it was like. Um, I think uh, we were up about 20 metres. Yeah. So quite, we were up quite a way. Big oh, that's quite impressive. Uh, and it's really clear because 4K. Yeah, oh well, look forward to that coming out. So Yeah, so that will be coming out. But, you know, the main thing is, uh, we, you know, we've got things coming out all the time and we try and release an episode on the podcast at least once one a week don't we yes yeah and we've got yeah a few exciting ones lined up to come out in the next few weeks yeah we have and i can't believe we're up to 35 i can't believe yeah. it can you yeah you know so uh, time marches on uh, so Gemma, would you like to introduce our guest please? yep okay so we've got episode 35 uh we talked to Gemma smith so she's obviously a female scuba diver and a yeah, great role model for us all. She's a technical diver, cave diver. She's an instructor, pass, paddy ambassador diver. She's an expedition leader. So she's certainly yeah, obviously done a lot. What has she done? Um, her parents are archaeologists. So she's got quite a passion for... I'm um, so glad you said that. <laughs> yep. So she's uh, yeah, got some interest in underwater archaeology. Um she experienced quite a horrific accident. She was involved in a car hitter, so she's had a lot to recover from um, from that. And she miraculously has gone back to diving. So she's not doing yeah, diving, but she is back in the water, which yeah, yeah. An incredible achievement. And also, our listeners may have heard of her name from Fourth Element as well. Yep, she's um, been one of their models. Um, yeah. Sort of uh, puts on their gear and appears on our website as well. So, and she was involved in the underwater film Dive Odyssey, which um, she filmed with Andy Torbett, one of our previous guests. Yeah. 
so yeah that's quite a, a great piece of filming to watch as well so yeah mr torbert was one of our first guests wasn't he he was yeah and he also mentioned it as well so yeah, Good, yeah. Um, and she's also, while we've been in lockdown, been working on a non-profit organisation called Oceana Trust, um, which is an organisation formed to show how both non-divers and divers can find the healing effects of scuba diving after some dramatic or mental issues. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There is actually, um, there's been quite a few people have shared about that, and obviously depth therapy do quite a bit of that as well. Yeah. You know, healing um healing aspects of scuba diving and also you know that is such a relaxing thing to do and yeah. you're on a really nice dive you know you can totally understand that well so it's I, an escape as well from you know, the noise of normal life so you're just and you're within your own world in the zone and it is yeah so and you've really got to get under the water to experience what that feels like i think a bit like me when i'm grass cutting you get in your zone you get in your zone you get in your zone <laughs> you do <laughs> listen yeah. to a good podcast you know and uh you know get in your zone so there we go well hopefully there'll be some yeah, people streaming and gardening listening <laughs> to now. listen to us yeah so, <laughs> so hopefully it'll be an entertaining episode 35 with Gemma smith talking to us from gang brand Haven. there we go Fall away So thank you, Gemma Smith, for joining the Big Scuba podcast today. So that's really good. And you're in Grand Cayman, Cayman Island. Yes, I am. Very good to see you. That's good. What's the weather like? Is it nice and hot? As always. It seems terrible for a Brit to complain about the heat, but it's almost <laughs> too hot here right now. What are you doing there? So I live in Grand Cayman with my partner. Yeah. So up to now, we've been splitting our time between here and then California and then England, obviously, where I'm from. And I actually originally came here just to um, spend a couple of weeks before going back, back home to the UK and then lockdown hit. So I've been here three and a half months now. And, uh, there's, to worse, I'd say, there's worse places to be stuck in lockdown. <laughs> yeah, no, that sounds good. So do you want to just tell our listeners a bit about yourself? So my name is Gemma Smith and I am a commercial and archaeological diver. I started diving when I was 17. Up to that point, I'd been into every other adrenaline sport imaginable. So bungee jumping, whitewater rafting, flying planes, skydiving, kayaking, <laughs> spent weeks living out in the woods, um, surviving on bushcraft skills. So anything quirky or strange I, I wanted to do, or anything different. But as much as I enjoyed them, I never really stuck to any of them. I enjoyed it for a bit, and then kind of got bored and moved on. And then when I was 17, I tried diving and I was hooked. I was absolutely hooked. I became obsessed with it. And for the last 13 years, that's all I've done pretty much. Various kinds of diving, starting out doing recreational stuff, doing a lot of teaching. I actually spent a year in Grand Cayman teaching in 2014, then moved over to the more technical diving, started working on commercial projects, archaeological projects. And now I work in a slightly different field doing expert witness work in diving related incidents wow all right okay yeah. do you get much call for that um surprisingly there's there's quite a little bit quite a bit of you know litigation surrounding dive incidents and boating incidents um it's very interesting work as well so I, i'm really yeah, enjoying it. how did you get into that um knowing the right people yeah <laughs> and i can over so i can't do um the, a lot of decompression diving anymore um, certain things with my, my, um, my health changed, so I'm no longer able to do decompression diving. So it was a good segue into something I was still interested in, diving, but in a slightly more land-based capacity. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's good. So are you more of a, um, uh, when you say technical dive, are you, are you still doing technical diving? Right now I'm not off to do technical diving. A couple of years ago I had a, a bad accident, a bad car accident, yeah. uh, and I broke my neck my coccyx both my legs two months in hospital and it just means that because of the healing process because i have a, a very large skin graft on my right leg decompression diving and circulation possible circular circulatory issues mean that i can't do decompression diving now mm. but but i'm loving you know what having gone from being a ccr cave diver doing 150 meter dives i'm out on a reef now 10 meters and i'm 
couldn't be happier. Seeing all the light. Seeing all the light. It's just amazing to get back to that, actually. Yeah, and the main thing is you're back in the water as well. That's just, yeah, that must be an amazing feeling. <laughs> it is. I mean, there was a time when I really wondered whether I'd get back in the water, and now I'm diving from my backyard in the ocean, and it's just heavenly. Yeah, good. So no twin sets, anything like that? Not yet. I'm hoping to be able to get back on twin sets soon. Uh, but both my legs are metal, so I have to be a little bit careful about weight bearing and yeah. um, take care of how much pressure I put on my knees. Mm. Mind you, you can put them on in, in the water. You see, that's one of the, the advantages. The water takes all the pressure away. It's no pain. It's right. just fantastic. It, it's so healing for so many people. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, that's yeah, good. Yeah. So what, have you actually got back in the water uh, now lockdown's easing? Have you actually had your first dive? Yep, we had our first dive last week. We've been diving the last two days. Wow. Uh, I think, I can't remember the last time, apart from when I was, I couldn't dive at all, the last time I've been out of the water that long, when I've been perfectly healthy. And it's so, it sounds terrible, but I'm looking out and I have a beach and a sea outside my window and I can't get in the water. <laughs> but finally, finally we're back allowed. Yeah, yeah, that must be a special feeling. So with your scuba diving, what made you try it? Was it just because it was another sort of extreme sport so to speak or did somebody inspire you to do it? What actually first inspired me to do it was there's a very very famous Wes Giles picture of a cave in Florida um, and cave divers and it's just so ethereal and I remember seeing it in a dive magazine I was looking through and I was looking for the next sport to try and I was just transfixed and I remember saying to myself I want to go there and obviously this is a deep cave dive on CCR and I'd never dove before so this was a, a long going to be a long way in the making but I just said I want to see that place it really looked like something from another planet and it's hard to believe that there's somewhere like that on earth that so few people have seen it's quite a special feeling yeah it must be amazing yeah yeah and there's all this ocean as well to explore as well yeah. well there That's is when, when we yeah. spoke to people at the Galapagos um you know and you know there's so much of that water around like just around then you know you're you're out that way in the Pacific and it's kind of like, well, how can you not know about all this scene? It's so vast. No? It's such a big space. That's what I always find so interesting is so many people look out to space and want to explore other planets and see what else is out there. And all I can think is we've barely scratched the surface of what's on this planet. We don't know. Yeah. It's in a fraction of what, what's in our oceans. You have no idea really what's there. And that I find exciting to think what might be down there, what we could find. Is, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that is. Yeah, are you still like recording dives? Are you still, you know, you logging your dives and what have you? I still log every single dive I do. Do you? That's good. I do. From the beginning, from when I was an open water diver. Thousands we of get dives. so many people on that say that they, don't, they've, they stop recording their dives because they've done so many, you know. No, I still record it. I'm a bit of a geek. I still write it down in a written logbook every time with diagrams. <laughs> and, oh, I'm so geeky. Diagrams. No, that's and I think it's good. You know, I think it's um, it's nice. Because how many dives have you done, would you say? Where, where are you up to? Uh, I've done, I, I can look at the logbook exactly, around 3,000. Wow. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, we've spoken oh, to people great. that get to 1,000 and they just go, no, I'm not doing it anymore. <laughs> just... yeah, it's good, isn't it? It's good that yeah. you've been diving this amount of time and done that many dives and still still logging them. It's good. I kind of yeah, think right. it's quite, quite cool that I might look back, you know, when I'm older and, go, oh, I remember that dive and look yeah. at that drawing or that picture and all that map and remember it. It's like keeping a diary, really, isn't it? It's like keeping your, well, like keeping a logbook. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Have you got any advice for people, either those that are thinking about trying scuba diving or they're just setting out on their journey? Like me? I think the first thing to, that I always tell students is it's okay to be nervous. It's a very strange feeling. I remember the first time I tried diving, you know, and I was in a swimming pool and you take those first breaths underwater and part of your brain is thinking, this is the most amazing thing ever. And the other part is thinking, this doesn't feel right. This is very bizarre that I shouldn't be able to do this. And it's okay to just sit with those feelings and realize that it does take a lot of time to get used to. And I think the key thing is practice. Dive as often as you can, even if it's a 20 minute skills dive um in one of the like bobster or chepstow if like if it's blown out you can't get to see mm -hmm. the other advice i always give to divers is whether it's 
doing an out of air drill or a mask flood, try and do one dive, one skill on every single dive. Yeah, that's good advice. Yeah, because it's easy just to kind of forget about the skills, I guess. Like, it's really it's what, easy. That's what we talked about the other day. Yeah. 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 I, I need to kind of get, I mean, diving is so much fun. You get so involved with it and the skills kind of go by the wayside a little bit. But it's really important that it becomes muscle memory. So if you ever do get to the point where you mask your mask floods or your buddy has an out of air situation, it's second nature to deal with it. It doesn't become what is in itself not that big an issue if mm-hmm. you're properly trained and up up to speed with it. It could multiply and actually end up becoming a bigger problem just because you haven't practiced. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, that's definitely and I can relate to the bit about the initial try dive and you think doesn't seem right. <laughs> yeah. It's true, isn't it? Yeah. You think back to how it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So but no, no, so but I've done eight dives now, so yeah, so yeah. It's, I think it's when you've been diving a long time, it's very easy to forget that initial turning your brain to th- realize, no, this is safe, this is okay, not to automatically. I know when I started and I started diving just in the pool, I felt that urge to hold my breath because <laughs> you're breathing underwater, this isn't right. And so it does take a while to just realize, no, the equipment works, this is a different environment, and just get diving. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, that's good advice. Yeah, definitely. Hopefully it will encourage more people to <laughs> give it a go. Um, yeah. Have you, in your sort of diving journey, have you noticed any difference from when you first started to like now in terms of um, probably the number of women diving and kind of just the attitudes to it? I think there's definitely been over the last few years a concerted effort to get more women involved in diving and particularly in technical diving, to show that it isn't a male-dominated sport. It's women are equally capable. Um, They might have to do things in slightly different ways. You know, sometimes the gear is very, very heavy, so dive side mount where you can carry two smaller tanks rather than one massive twin set. Uh, When I started, I started on twin sevens, then moved up to um, twin eight and a halves, and finally made up to twelves, and then went to 50 kilogram rebreather, so everything is possible if you take it in stages and like any kind of training, any kind of athletic training, start small and just keep working at it and keep working your way up. Mm. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, because it is quite really? a physical thing. It is. As we found, isn't it? You know, as, uh, you know fitness does come into uh, diving and you see it quite a bit, especially when you do shore cover, somewhere with like a uh, stony cove, you see all sorts of things and people come out, faces absolutely red and they're out of puff and everything you know, it, you know fitness is definitely a good thing with uh, diving i think um, fitness is something that's often overlooked with diving because you think oh you just pop in the water and swim around a bit and it's not actually that physically hard but even just getting gear you know from shore diving great example you know from the car getting it down to the water you do an hour's dive when you're moving constantly or a drift dive where, where you're swimming against current it can be surprisingly tiring. Fitness is is a really important aspect of being a safe and competent diver. Yeah. 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 No, we've had a few what five hundred meter walk with all kitted up in a dry suit <laughs> in the sun. <laughs> it's just yeah. Cook them as you go. <laughs> yeah, and you, you just kind of get in the water and you just think, I just need to just sit here, lie here for just ten minutes and get my breath. Yeah. 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 So some of the UK shore diving is um, because surprisingly, when you're clambering over rocky terrain and walking on sand wearing heavy gear it's, it's a workout it is. yeah do you do you actually physically work out to keep your fitness for diving yes i do it's something that i have been guilty of in the past not doing as much as i should um when i was diving so often that was kind of my workout now i'm not diving quite as often as i used to i i walk every day i do yoga i do weights just to keep myself physically strong and healthy. So when I do dive, picking up, you know, however much, you know, however 20 kilograms worth of gear is, don't, I don't think anything of. Yeah. yeah, that's good. Yeah, I think we often wear um, uh, a Mizo. Have you, have you heard of a company called Mizo? No. It's like, um, we use them at um, the gym quite a bit. And uh, it's a heart rate tracker and sort of fitness tracker. And I've worn one under my dry suit a few times and uh, to see the sort of results and you get like uh, how many calories you burn and they call these MEP 
steps, which is like a, a point system, which is based on your heart rate, fitness, and all these sort of things. And it's quite interesting how that has changed uh, on me, and uh, Gemma uh, has now started wearing one as well, is that you can see uh, your progress of fitness um, and yeah. diving, how you how that matches also with your air intake because instead of it now being like in the ambers and the yellows with your heart rate when you're swimming you know it's more of a blue and a gray which is good on the miser and it shows that your heart rate is not coming up which obviously is then affecting your oxygen because you're yeah, not air consumption yeah, yeah which is really <laughs> quite good uh so I fitness find that really interesting to track it and see especially with as you get fitter physically and more confident or comfortable mentally how that will affect it yeah yeah, yeah i think on, on my that was the first time i on my qualification weekend yeah it was like woo yeah. in the red <laughs> yeah this is like straight. yeah and i think that's completely normal for all new divers yeah. and then as you get more used to it more confident and comfortable with the skills and in yourself and in your ability to dive you know that automatically is going to lower your heart rate Lower your air consumption, make you more relaxed, and the more you do it, the fitter you get physically. So it's just you yeah. know yeah. all these factors coming together. Yeah, yeah, it'd be good to monitor it. So you know what drew you to tech diving? I think the biggest thing for me is all the wrecks around the South Coast. You know, England, UK, with you know the Channel, there's amazing diving, but a lot of it tends to be slightly deeper. Uh, in the kind of 40 to 50 meter range that I was like the soul set I'd always always wanted to do the soul set yeah and I didn't feel comfortable with the redundancy of diving on a single tank so right. very early on I wanted to get into tech diving so I started out doing all open circuit like I say I started out on mini doubles and gradually worked my way up to bigger doubles and then I started wanting to do push it even further so go deeper and particularly cave diving and yeah. wreck penetration and logistically there were dives i wanted to do that just wouldn't have been possible on open circuit so the sheer number of cylinders or you know the planning the logistics of doing it going on to rebreather was something i knew i wanted to do but i wanted to yeah. equally have the open circuit background so i understood that mm. side of dive because particularly people go on to rebreather you know very early but they forget that if they have to bail out they could be doing a lot of time on open circuit. And I wanted to have that comfort and understanding with open circuit before yeah. making the switch to CCR. It makes sense, actually. How you describe it, it makes a, that progress actually makes sense and it's a good way of doing it. Yeah, I wanted to be very comfortable on open circuit. So if a rebreather ever did fail, which, of course, you know, it has failed on before, mm. I had that automatic comfort switch where it wasn't a big deal. Now I'm suddenly blowing bubbles. It was... Oh, I remember this. I, you know, I've I've been here, done this a, a million times. It's not an issue. Yeah. Yeah. Was it quite a steep learning curve going from open circuit to rebreathers? It was. I, I and I have no problem saying this. It was an incredibly frustrating learning. I went from a full trimix, full cave diver, and open circuit. I, you know, I was a good diver. You know, happily doing a hundred meter dives, long cave penetration, to feeling where I couldn't hold my buoyancy at all it was like being a new diver and it was so frustrating how could i've gone from you know full trimix cave dives to i'm in a swimming pool and i'm bouncing around like a tennis ball i couldn't <laughs> do anything and you know honestly it took me probably a good hundred hundred plus hours until i really felt yes i've got yeah. this i'm comfortable i'm as comfortable as i was on open circuit i'll be though haven't you you know because your life's on the line you know you've got to be you got to be uh au okay fait with it and uh confident yeah, especially doing those um and especially with you know closed circuit there's so much more to it there's so much more that you know, involved in it and that could go wrong and things you have to be aware of that i wanted that motor reflex that mm -hmm. i immediately feel comfortable know what i'm doing so i spent a good plus 100 hours you know in quarries no deeper than 10 meters just yeah. getting comfortable with the skills yeah. I, was thinking, I was thinking it's been quite amazing. Yeah, when we think back to, um, let's say, John Chatterton, you know, he was one of the yeah. pioneers of the rebreather. And he was doing these deep dives, full knowing that it was going to go wrong. In fact, he was doing it to try and break it to, so he could yeah. fix it 
underwater and deal with it. And, you know, that was all part of the involve, that uh, evolve of rebreathers. And you think, you know, you've got to have really your, your wits about you and know everything about that inside yes. and out to the point where you can break it and fix it and keep, keep breathing. Keep going. And, keep going. <laughs> and carry on being safe. Yeah, the pioneers. Yeah, exactly. The Although you but to actually deal with all that underwater at depth uh, and keep a straight and level mind about that, you know, it takes them to do it. A lot of people couldn't do that. Yeah, uh, you know, to actually test rebreathers, knowing full well it probably won't work, but having that, like you say, that in depth understanding of exactly not only the mechanics behind it, but the science behind it to make sure you're all breathing, you know, a safe, breathable gas incredibly complex it does take a certain personality like a test pilot mm. so what do you call yourself do you call yourself a wreck diver or do you call yourself a cave diver? i would probably class myself more as a cave diver than a wreck diver because yeah. that's my background i've spent months and months in florida mexico france but actually my favorite type of diving is a what i would call a combination between cave and wreck which is mine diving Okay. I love mine diving. Right. Yeah. So into ready made, so like pre made mines that are flooded. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And I think for me, that combines the challenge of overhead diving. Um, I love being pushed. I love you know, the challenging environment and really having to be at the top of your game to dive there safely. But as growing up with two archaeological parents, you know, they were both archaeologists, I find the human history in mines really yeah. fascinating. What was your favourite? My favourite mine would have to be ooh, Oyama in Finland. Yeah. And what, some what of the is hardest it stuff. It is probably some of the hardest diving I've ever done. You know, it's two degrees Celsius, it reverse, reverse thermocline. So you go in at two degrees and your decompression's all at one degree. And it's, but because it's so cold, obviously the water is like air. It's kind of surreal. You almost don't feel like you're diving. And you get structures like Hell's Gate, you know, at, 60, 70 meters and um, Lucifer's pillar. And I was lucky enough to dive it on a film shoot. So when I, I saw these structures for the first time, they were all lit up with video lights. And it um, is the most out of this world thing I think I've ever seen. And the so water is that definitely clear. speared in my mind, yeah. 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 Do, you, do you see any life down there? Are there any creatures or is it pretty much kind of? Oyama was, it was too cold. There's, there's nothing, mm. to, nothing to say. But in, in caves in Florida, you know, you do see fish and um, so, some kind of cave specific animals, but it's not common in the caves no. I've done. Yeah, no, it's yeah, pretty amazing. How do you deal with the cold then? How do you, do you, have you is it something you just got used to? Because the hardest, although your body, you know, and you've got your underlay and all that, I, the, I always found the, the hardest thing to deal with is the actual freeze and cold temperatures on your head. Yeah, I mean, my. One of my biggest struggles over the years, I have done, I'm just kind of specialised in cold water diving. And someone with my frame, I don't have a lot of bioprene to keep me warm. So I have really struggled over the years with being cold. I have gone to what extreme... What was that word, bio what? What's that? What was that word? Bioprene. Bioprene. <laughs> yes. Not neoprene. No. Oh, I wish. I wish. Because <laughs> I don't have any of that. <laughs> that one too. <laughs> oh, so did you just layer up to get over the cold? I layered up, so I went kind of started off wearing lots of layers, too cold. Um, went to heated vest, um, uh, dry gloves. Um, there have been occasions when, much to my shame, I have actually tucked a little hot water bottle down my undergarment <laughs> just to keep me warm. I, yeah, in, one time in Scapa Flow, my heated vest failed. And I was determined to dive, and I was equally determined that I was not going to be cold. That's so, got to be a bit risky, isn't it? Yeah, I wouldn't necessarily recommend a hot water bottle. But, <laughs> and then obviously now with more studying, they're wondering the, how active versus passive heating affects decompression. So, you know, theories are changing. So seven mil hood? Seven mil hood. I actually found what worked really well is I wore two hoods. So I wore a three and a five or a three and a seven. Yeah. Um, that helped a lot. This, uh, the but, Scandinavians have it down where they have dry hoods. Yeah. Um, oh, somebody else was telling us about that. You know, and that's actually part of their dry suit and it comes over. Yeah. Good idea. Your head stays completely dry. Um, yeah. And then 
properly integrated dry gloves. So literally, you know, you have this tiny portion of your face where you're getting cold. Yeah. Yeah. I could do that at Stony Cove. I hate it when my head get cold. Oh, I, I learned to... Do you remember Horsey Island? Yeah. I remember I learned to dive there what, when I was 17, so goodness, 13 years ago, in February, in a wetsuit. Ooh, yeah. And in a wetsuit. You've got all this to come, Gemma. In a wet, <laughs> In a wetsuit. And I yeah, think I was, we're in Spain. I was explaining why... Um, to Gemma uh, the other day is why <laughs> why is always handy why is always nice to take your hood and gloves back to the hotel with you uh, rather than uh, leave them in the van on a frosty night oh and then they're solid so they're you got that first thing to put your hood on a friend of mine who's got a camper van he, he boils the kettle and then just tips hot water into it first yeah, and then it on. It on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah that, that's the other option oh yeah but I've definitely done that when you leave your, you're tired, you know, and cold at the end of a long day. You leave your gear in, in the van and you literally get up early the next morning and it is frozen solid yeah. in the van. Yeah. And you think, why? Why did I choose this as my hobby? Yeah. Or at Gildy where they've got the metal butt frame and you come out of the dive and you put your hood down and you go back to it in about five, ten minutes and it's actually frozen stuff. You can't, you can't get it off. Yeah. You can't well, get, you get it off. off. Oh, yes. And then you go back in the water to warm up. You do, you do, because that's the only way. No, this is the joys of UK boys. <laughs> you've got this to come, Gemma. You've got this experience to come. Oh, I'll tell you what, all through the year. UK diving does have, you know, we all love to complain, the UK dive community, oh. but there is there's something quite magical about UK diving. Oh, I think it's very great. Yeah. And this is the whole thing, talking to all the people that we've spoken to over the last few months. UK diving is like... You know, it's come out really on top and like it's so diverse, you know, from Scotland to the South Coast, to Ireland. Yeah, so it's certainly a place. Don't mind not travelling because there's plenty here, more than enough to get. Yeah. There is so much here. There's, you know, you can get your fill of marine life and wrecks and, you know, just beautiful shore diving. And the other thing that I really like is because maybe it's because it's a small kind of island and the diving isn't always easy. The general UK diving community is so welcoming. Yeah. Everyone sticks together, which I love. Yeah, yeah. it's true. It's a, it's a small community, but, they, you know, that is nice and f- friendly. So that is good like that. Um, so, and you've been in a film? Yes. You've this been was in a film a called F- Dive Odyssey? Dive Odyssey, yes. So how was that? Tell us about that. So that was Divers of the Dark, a very well-known Scandinavian film team. And I became friends with them several years back, met, met them at Tech Dive USA. And Yanni, who's one kind of one half of the duo, had this vision of making a diving film based on kind of Space Odyssey. Um, what, Space Odyssey 2001? Space Odyssey 2001, yeah. Oh. Um, something, you know, we all love diving. We're all avid divers. Diving films can be a little bit boring, just watching someone else swim around on a reef. He wanted to bring the magic of diving and how surreal and otherworldly it was. So he took all this inspiration from um, Blade Runner and Space Odyssey, and he wanted to make an underwater sci-fi film. Right. So myself and Andy Talbot were the two characters in the film. There's no dialogue, and I'm the explorer, so I'm off traveling. Um, this underwater realm and Andy Torbert is the other being. <laughs> so, I'm sure he's been called worse. <laughs> I, I have no doubt he's been, I've probably called him worse. <laughs> yeah, no, Andy and I had a great time. It took, it was probably two years in the making. It was several different um, filming um, areas. So there was one in Finland, in Oyama. Then we went up to Northern Norway to film in the yeah. cave there. And then the final section was filmed in a swimming pool in Helsinki. Wow. Yeah. What was your favourite bit of the, making the film? What's the, the bit that really sort of stands out? For me, seeing Hell's Gate for the first time in Oyamo, yeah. and then also diving in Plura cave system under the ice. And I've never dove under ice in that sense before. And it was just magical, surreal, bizarre yeah, I bet. Yeah. Some of the videos and of people doing that. Have you seen Wim Hof? And he, sw- yeah, he does Wim that Hoff. in, in yeah. just a pair of uh, speedos. I know. That the takes Wim you Hoff, 
Like, I'm not sure I could do that. Uh, no. <laughs> I can play no, bitterly and I'm wearing a dry suit and a heated vest. So I'm not sure how people do it in, you know, swimsuits. I often think that about uh, that in April. You, you, you go to some of these places yeah. and there we are in the thermals and the dry suit and the hood, gloves, freezing cold. And there you look round and there they are, open water swimmers now getting in in, a, in budgie smugglers and a swimsuit. <laughs> I know. I know. I don't know how they do it. I've got a, I've got a friend. Um, you probably heard of her, Kiki Bosch, um, ice free diver. Right, I've looked her up. I haven't heard of her, to be honest. Yeah, s- slight woman, um, probably around my age, and she's literally in a bikini, free diving in the most inhospitable, freezing cold environments. And I look at her and think, I couldn't. I don't think I could ever do what you do. No, it's yeah. just a shock. Even oh, yeah, yeah, uh, like yeah, the sh- exactly. even when you know you jump in you know to one of the quarries and you realize your dry suit isn't fully done up, done up and you get that first initial just a little bit of cold no. and you jump a mile into the air i definitely don't know what that's like <laughs> yes you do <laughs> <laughs> i think we all do at some point i'm glad to hear that I, I you know i did get an award for it you know last year but that that's all there it's ready to pass that mantle piece on to <laughs> we do uh, what it does so- next. <laughs> Sorry? But wants to be never repeated. <laughs> well, it's true. And um, unfortunately, now That's Matt, where I go, I do get reminded of it quite a bit. Who oh, you got your dry suit done up? <laughs> yeah, once but, you make a mistake, you'll never do that one again. Yeah, first dive last year with a whole group of students. Yeah, not, not, not dry suit. They're all brand work. new thermals. As, all new th- uh, lovely f- thermals as well. So uh, had all my fourth elements on, all lovely and snug. So, we haven't got to the end of our chat with Gemma Smith, but we just wanted to mention about other ways you can support the Big Scuba podcast. Ian and I both enjoy adventures under and on the water, and some of which you can view on our YouTube channel called The Big Scuba. The links are in the podcast show notes. Have a look and a view of the videos. There are even product reviews, including my Fourth Element Hydra dry suit review and the Exotherm thermals that go underneath. Please do subscribe, ring the bell, so you get notifications of up and coming videos in the next few weeks. There's lots coming out. We always really appreciate your support, so thank you very much. But anyway, talking about the film though, um, you know, scuba diving in films is notoriously done really, really badly. Uh, because if, if you look at um, 47 metres down, have you seen that one? I have. We actually watched that the other day. That's um, just, amazing just like, really? background search, yes. And they go, you know, they're, they're down at 47 metres for hours on end with hardly any air, but somehow they make it, and then they go whizzing up to the surface, <laughs> and they're fine. You know, like, they're fi- yeah, really? there's no background research on a lot of these films. I know. So it's really good that, you know, you've done a really good film about it, you know, and the ethics are, are brilliant, and you just like, yeah, this is what's possible. Yeah, Not This is actually what scuba diving can be like. Yeah, yeah. 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 And there's quite a few films. You know, James Bond did one. Uh, which one is it? I think it's, uh, I can't remember what his name, Jack. One of the early James Bond, Doctor No, I think it was, where you need to get eaten by a shark in the end because it's all done behind in a swimming pool. Uh, Sean Connery's one side of the glass, the shark's the other side of the glass, and the shark was clever in what the people were because the, the shark worked out the glass didn't go all, th- all the way to the end of the pool. There was a gap. Oh, my yeah. goodness. So um, I think actually it's Thunderball. It's Thunderball was the film. But, yeah... Diving in films, you use them, you just look at it, just like, why, you know, don't do it. Or if you don't do it correctly, but I suppose they have to do it for Hollywood purposes don't don't they? to actually make a film. But you know, yeah, I understand the principles of what diving's actually like. Yeah, I was just finishing off a Jill Hines edit a little while ago, and she was like decompression or, for 17 hours. And I think it's just like, yeah, and nobody realizes this, do they? Yeah. yeah, Jill's just one of a kind as well. Yeah, I know. Um, you just mentioned Fourth Element. So is it right you've done some modelling for them? You've helped Fourth Element out? Yes, yeah. I used to do some, some modelling for them. And um, yeah, Jim Standing is a great guy, great yeah. company. Uh, very, very involved in all aspects of the diving community. So yeah. he's definitely one, one of the good guys. Yeah, he is. Uh, it's been really great, you know, yeah. for us as well. 
Um, hasn't he, Gem? He has. He's given me a dry seat. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. Congratulations. Yeah, so I've yet to uh, get it in the water. But yeah, it's all ready to go now. So yeah, I've got my gear underneath. So yeah, it's really exciting. So, I'll be a fourth element girl. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Yeah, so they're a good company and they make great gear. Yeah, so looking forward to that. So it's even more reason to get in the water scene. They are. And they, you know, they're very good on their um, sustainability and ethics yes. as well. So Yeah, yeah the, the ocean positive range. Um, they really do try and give back. Yeah, no, it's an important yeah. to support companies like that as well and have that ethic behind it. It's, you know, it just makes you feel better about what you're doing. Um, yeah, completely agree. Yeah, no, that's good. Um, so you, obviously we know you had quite a serious accident um, back a good well a few years ago. So are you sort of getting well onto the road of recovery now? And diving is much more sort of easy to do. Yes. Yep. I'm okay, I'm back on rebreather. Um, I'm not doing decompression diving, but I'm I have been back cave diving, rebreather oh, diving. Right. What it's actually been a really nice change for me now because I live in Grand Cayman now. I've always been in you know well the last five also years i've been so focused on the tech diving it's all been rebreathed it's all been deep stuff and it's been lovely to just discover the joy of my partner and i just go single tank shore diving and yeah. going back and rediscovering that joy is in it has just been really exciting actually you yeah. know I, I, it's easy to forget just how much fun you can have in 10 meters of water looking for a little squidgy nudibranchs yeah yeah, no, that's good, and yeah, it's just so good that you're back in the water and yeah, able to get get in there again. So, get, get is there, there like a diving. limit? Have you been given a, a limit, or is the limit at forty meters, or have you been given the limit right now is forty meters, so recreational depths mm -hmm. and no decompression diving. Yeah, um, <laughs> which at the time I kind of I didn't take necessarily that well, but in a way I'm grateful because it's like I just. So it's given me the opportunity to rediscover how much fun you can have you know, yeah. in 10 minutes of the water looking at, looking at fish, which I'd, I hadn't done for so long. And you can so still see a lot, can't you? And you can still you do can a see lot. so much. You can see so much. You know, there's beautiful wrecks here, the coral heads. And what's been really fun is we've been doing off the beaten track dive sites. So no idea what they are. We just drive up, get them off the shore. Sometimes it's nothing but sand. And sometimes it's beautiful coral heads and turtles and eagle rays. Oh, amazing. We've got one coming up like that, and um, which uh, <laughs> came, came, it came up at the weekend, and somebody's asked us to go dive it. And uh, it's not all that far away, and I don't think we'll be seeing any manta rays in it, unfortunately. <laughs> but um, it's going to be quite interesting. It's a very old place, and um, there, it's uh, I can't really say too much in a minute because we'll it'll be sort of new content when we go out and do it. But, uh, yeah, quite interesting, I think. Um, it, it's uh, exciting not no, we'll fishing. There. Yeah. It is. Yeah, you don't know what we're going to see. You don't know what we're going to find. Yeah, it could be nothing or it could be something incredible. And that kind of sense of discovery and exploring is, yeah. is really exciting. Yeah. Yeah, it is. yeah, look forward to that one. <laughs> I, I think, um, but I, I think, you know, doing the right thing, because the other option would have been, I suppose, after your accident, is that they said, no more diving for you so although you might at the time i can understand why you said you know you was a bit upset about not being able to tech dive but you're still going to have diving and then enjoy it and you know still want to fish and explore and you know do all these things that's it you know there's so much out there about the oceans we still don't know there's so much that hasn't been seen it doesn't just have to be Isn't that amazing though? i find it incredible that we know more about the moon than we know about the ocean yeah so, i think that's also a good thing because if, if all the mysteries have all gone of the world, yeah. and that kind of bit sad, you kind of think, well, <laughs> yeah. is that it? Yeah, no, yeah. that kind of need to explore and discover, I think is innate in a lot of us. And yeah. it, it is, you know, intriguing and cool to think, we still don't have any idea of what could be out there. Yeah. He's just telling me he got a new heated vest. <laughs> oh, really? What kind? An earth suit. Um, um, to be honest, I've had it a while, but the um, I need to thank him actually, and I told him today I'd give him a little thank you and a bit of a review because the previous pads they weren't all that uh, well, they weren't all that good, I don't think, and they didn't really stand up to a lot of wear. Um, and I just mentioned it to him that I had to have them soldered again, 
and uh, they kindly sent me some new pads and new wires and everything. So uh, really good. Oh, that's a good service. That is, isn't it? So uh, yeah, uh, and the the new pads that they've sent are a lot better. A lot well, you can see there's a, an improvement in the construction. Uh, you know, it's a whole bit of constructed thing. So uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to trying that out. Ooh, Not yet. I look too hot. Too, it's nice. <laughs> there he is. Oh, yeah. Don't get too hot otherwise. I'll wait till about December, January. Oh, I remember. I think the only time I've ever been too hot diving is diving inside a volcanic crater in Utah, this homestead crater. And really? I was diving in a bikini. And I think that's the only time. It was on a rubbery there. I've only, I, the first and only time I've ever thought, a bit warm, you know. I am, I'm a bit warm. <laughs> Not how, like, how warm was it? Uh, oh, now you're asking me. I'll have to look it up. Look at Homestead Crater. It's um, they do a lot of training there. It's shallow. Um, I was doing rebreather training there, and it's, it was it was an experience. It was definitely an experience. Homestead what? Sorry. Homestead Crater in Utah. Crater. Okay, we'll look it up. What's the name of your cat, by the way? <laughs> oh, well, you, you just had a visitor on your settee. <laughs> she is uh, quite a little character. So we got we just recently adopted her from the Humane Society here, and she came as Curry. Um, but we don't call her curry. We ended up calling her squeakers because she makes this little <laughs> noise all the time. She's what two months old, and she's in the terrible toddler you phase. Called her I think. <laughs> no, <laughs> she's she's adorable. She's just love her to love her oh, to bits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Tika, oh, yeah, or Tika. <laughs> or <laughs> Tika. I like that. Tika's a good name. If I have a cat, I'm going to call it Tika. <laughs> I don't know. If I was naming after my favourite curry, it would have to be Vindaloo. Really? Oh, I'm a Vindaloo girl. Oh, wow. <laughs> Can I just say praise be? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I have a uh, crazy spice tolerance. I'm a, I'm, I'm a Madras. And I was kind of, or Patia. Patia is about a medium. Vindaloo, though, a serious sort of curry. Yeah, method. I have been known to ask for an extra spicy Vindaloo. So we're talking oh, chilli masala now. Oh, yeah. Easy. Wow. Gemma, where, where are you on your chilli level? Well, I don't mind hot things. I, I throw quite a lot of chilli and a lot of garlic into things. Yeah. Mm. Curry-wise, tikka or a bowl tea is more. And for anyone who's now tuning into this, this is not Master Chef. <laughs> this is actually a screen time podcast. We do like... In fact, this could be a new question. Where's your chilli level? Well, yeah, I was going to say, where's your curry level? I like but, this because we could find out between all the scuba divers who we speak to, who has the hottest tongue? And that at the moment, you. you've got the highest rate <laughs> on, the, on the chili level. Yeah, out of one person asked, but I, I'm happy. I, I'm going to enjoy my time at number one. Do you think we should ask some of the other people? Yeah, it'd be an interesting one. We could have a little ranking like they do on the curries, like one chili, two chilies. And Gemma Smith <laughs> is in the pole position at the moment. <laughs> I like it. I do, I do like the random questions. Yeah, well, we've got oh, some of those coming you up. You come to the right place. <laughs> yeah. You like random questions. I do like random right place. <laughs> uh, so, one of our last kind of normal questions was where, what are your thoughts on the future of diving? In the sense of my future in diving or diving as a whole? Your diving and then diving as a whole for the industry as, a, as one. I think right now that's a difficult question to answer, especially with everything that's been going on in the world this year mm. i think a lot of people have you know time and financially can't necessarily invest right now in you know taking up a new hobby yeah are you in uh, lockdown where you are no we've come out of lockdown the airports are all still closed but yeah. um lockdown as a whole is over we're now allowed in restaurants we have we're um, wearing face masks is required still so yeah. we have to wear those all the time but um the 24 7 lockdown is, is over um, but the future of diving for you, where do you see it? The future of diving for me is definitely carry on enjoying my fun diving, my shore diving, my single tank diving. I'm loving it. And I'm focusing more and more on the legal side now, expert mm -hmm. witness work, working as a consultant um, in dive related incidents. And that's really where my passion is. It's quite interesting. I find it fascinating. I find it really, really fascinating. It's um, with my background in diving, it helps to understand. I'm now learning all the legal aspects 
and putting them together. And it's like being a detective working on these cases. How did you get into that? A lot of it's luck. You know, I've been in a professional diver for the last decade, going to trade shows, going to dive shows. I was able to, it's something I've always been interested in, but I was able to kind of make my journey into that world um, at a perfect time. Mm. sometimes these things happen for a reason don't they? It's, yeah. yeah I do believe that and right now I'm very happy with the direction I'm still involved with diving in a slightly different way yeah that's yeah. good yeah. Um, and I find the mental challenge and um, having to really think about it and get involved with it and get really deep into the standards and different agencies rules it's absolutely fascinating yeah yeah no that's good and you can tell your passion you know it's just comes out yeah Mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm very, very happy with where uh, my direction right now. Yeah, no, that's a good place to be. Yeah, definitely. So, yeah. so what we'll do is we'll empty. We ask questions to all our guests. We've got five questions, so everybody gets the same question asked, and then we sort of put all the answers together, and we'll have like a ranking. Um. So, first question is: What dive location is on your wish list, bucket list, and why? If I could dive anywhere. Oh, hello, squeakers. I'd love to do Russia, actually. Beluga yeah. whale. Wow. I'd love it. I've always been, as someone who hates the cold, it's completely contrary. I've always been drawn to the cold places to dive. And ice diving, beluga whales, I just think it would be magical to yeah, dive there. Yeah. Oh, well, hopefully one day you've had a bit of a cold water experience. Yeah. Right now, I, I am enjoying my Khmer kind of warm water time yeah yeah no i bet it's really nice um so talking of marine life what is your favorite marine animal and why octopus easy that's why i have a giant octopus tattooed on my side i just think they're the most intelligent fascinating creatures and um, there's so much we still don't know about them and when you see them underwater and they change color and it's awesome to see they're awesome to see and just their intelligence as well, I find really intriguing. Yeah, I watched one on the deck of the Thistlegorn, and oh, um, wow. I, could, I could honestly, I could have been there for hours just watching yeah. that. That was fascinating. I had other fish around it, and eventually it went off, and it just disappeared. You know, it changed colour. And while it's there, and we think there was a lionfish was trying to get it, and the other fish were in between the lionfish and the octopus, and whether it's getting stressed or whatever you could you know it was changing colors between her eyes, you know in front of her eyes like wow it's just it, is, it, it is other world you kind of go in a trance you could just watch them and it matched the same color as the deck of the physical it was that it was going that color it's incredible yeah yeah mm. amazing good choice yeah yeah no that's a good one so if you were diving and uh, you could take three guests with you and doesn't matter whether they dive or free dive or snorkel, who do you take? And they, they can be anyone from history um, or family or anyone of present day. Oh, if I could take anyone diving. Yeah. I think that would have to be my partner, cause my yeah. regular dive buddy, um, my stepson but he's only five so he's not allowed to dive yet but i think he would get such a hoot looking at everything he's so curious we're in an octonauts phase right now so it's everything under the sea everything <laughs> under the sea. and very like very boring i'd love to hit my mum diving i did try and teach her and she didn't like it but i would make her like it and take her diving <laughs> good. three good choices yeah yeah no that's really nice so yeah tempt them into the underwater world <laughs> exactly yeah, me family Introducing something I love to people I love is kind of why, partly why I got into diving, why I've always enjoyed teaching. Mm. Yeah, yeah, no, I don't understand that. So, what's your favourite uh, piece of dive kit? What's the bit, the one piece that you can't deal with, do without? My favourite bit of dive kit, gear, my heated vest. I love. <laughs> I know I, they. I have been known to dive dry suit and came in, much to my shame. But now I, I feel. You know, I tell people like, when I dive in Cayman, you know, I, I dive in, you know, shorts and, you know, like thermocline shorts and a thermocline top. I don't tell them I also have a heated vest underneath said top. <laughs> so that's my dirty little secret. So what's, what do you do you use? What, 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 what sort is it? This one is, I'll have to, so I have, well, under my dry suit, I have a Santee heated vest, but yeah. that's for dry only. So that's connected to, you know, a canister battery. 
Okay. So that's for that's for um, dry. For wet, I have. I need, I need to look it up. Adventure heat. Okay, that works all right. And uh, that works really really well. It's got three different heat levels. Um, you turn it on and off underwater. You can change it underwater. It's. I, I, I might have to look into that. <laughs> <laughs> that's the blanket. <laughs> and we have my heat heat all the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, last question for you. Okay, um, so you you know you're a person who's dived all around the world and dived with lo lots of people. You you've got a billboard and you can put a message on there, an image, a question, a statement, whatever you want, even your your chili limit if you want to. But you want to put you want to get a message out there on that billboard to the millions and billions of people out there. Okay, what would you put on it? If I wanted to get a message, it'd probably be. Go see what's out there. Go yeah. see what's out there. I like that. Why? Because I think nowadays there's, you know, you look at past explorers in the past, you know, the Shackletons and Gusto, and I think there's still so much out there and we've become possibly too reliant on things like ROVs and AUVs and mechanics and engineering, which have their place for sure. But I think there's still so much out there that we as human beings can go discover. And that for me is what drives me and has driven me in the past. And continues to make me want to go see what's out there yeah so that sense of adventure as well yes. it is that sense of adventure whether that being diving deep or cave diving or even just going to an unknown shore diving yeah. you can all find somewhere to have an adventure yeah or even the joys of snorkeling it's just i was watching a video on instagram and they just snorkeled but yeah had a great time with seals and yeah completely yeah. wowed yeah yeah exactly exactly yeah. Yeah. Nothing to be scared of. It's yeah, if you're safe, anything's possible. Yeah, anything's possible. Yeah, just have to take that first step and go out there and explore. Yeah, yeah, no, that's great. No, no, great answer. So really, really good. Thank you very much. But right now, I'm actually in the process of building my own charity. It's called the Oceanus Trust. Uh, it's working towards introducing people who have had mental or physical struggles and showing them how healing the diving world can be. Mm. So the okay. Oceanus Trust has been my my biggest focus the last few weeks and months, building that up and introducing oh, that to the world. Has yeah. it got a website? The website is being built as we speak. Because if anyone yeah. do want to follow you, where, where are they best to go? Where are you on social media? Um, I'm on Facebook um, in a limited way, but apart from that, I am not as involved with social media as I used to be. Okay. It's fair yeah. enough. Yeah. It's cool. Yeah. So it's been really good talking to you. It's just, yeah, and it's so good because your passion comes over so much about diving. It's just, a, you know, we've got all different types of people that listen to us. So, you know, from non divers right through to the experienced souls, you know, it's, it's appealing, yeah, to every person that listens. I'm glad we finally managed to uh, make it work. And we did. the side. We did. We got this done. I will. Thank you very much. You right? It's really good to chat. Good talking. Yeah, no, it's yeah. brilliant. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time. Yeah. All right, have a great rest of the day. You too, guys. And speak All soon. Right. Okay, Thanks bye, Gemma. Much. Thank you. Bye. bye. Welcome back, everybody. Gemma, what do you think to that? As coming from another Gemma, I really enjoyed it. Yes, Gemma and Gemma. Yeah, it's very good. Yeah, uh, Gemma's, yeah, Gemma's with G's as well, not J's. <laughs> <laughs> nice one. Uh, yeah, really nice chat and um, really good to hear from Gemma and also, uh, you know, a touching and inspiring story. There we go. Yeah, yeah, it certainly shows what you can be and what can happen and what you can come back from as well. Yeah, absolutely. As a lot of people face challenges, especially with, you know, current climate at the moment, um, it's good. Yeah, it's quite inspiring that somebody can um, face these great big uh, challenges in their lives and overcome and, and uh, get back in the water and dive, you know. Yeah, and back to loving life again. It is, yeah, and that's really important. So, uh, you know, it's not always about the, you know, the getting these great big depths and stuff. Sometimes it's just getting in the water, finding the magic. And yeah. Yeah, seeing the life and that's good enough. Yeah. Yeah, so that was a lovely interview with It was, yeah. So thank you very much, Gemma. Thank you thank you very much. Uh so coming up next on the Big Scoop podcast on episode thirty-six, <laughs> we've got 
Simon Rogerson from Scuba Magazine. Yep, and he was a great person to interview. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Full of uh, loads of experience, wasn't he? Yeah, he's done loads, and uh, yeah. so Simon writes for the the B, especially the Bizac magazine, isn't it? Scuba magazine. Yeah. Uh, also for the Times. Yeah, uh, he does lots of other publications. I think he's called upon to do reviews and um, articles on diving, liverboards, that sort of thing. Yeah, done a lot and uh, lots of experience. Um, that was really an informative chat that I think we had. It was, so, yeah, really nice. Yeah, enjoyed that and uh, thoroughly nice bloke. So, uh, top marks. Yeah. So, uh, that's enough from us, really, from waffling on. Gemma, anything else we need to cover before we go? Uh, no, just check out the YouTube channel, The Big Scuba, and keep up to date with our on the water and under the water adventures and our product reviews as well. Yes, we always need YouTube subscribers. We need to get a few more of them. So uh, if you haven't been over there to have a look at our YouTube channel, look it up, the Big Scuba Podcast. There yeah, we go. Exactly. Yeah, All so right. that'd be a great help. Yeah. So and then well. if you have any suggestions of guests you would like us to talk to or topics to discuss, then drop us an email or just drop us a direct message on our social media, Facebook, Instagram or Twitter. Yeah, and uh, occasionally we get the odd questions as well uh, from people who've got um, questions regarding diving or, you know, they've, they've got questions about even paddleboard and kayak and you name it. So it's always good to answer them and, um, you know, that'd be really good to read them out as well. So do do test us and send them in. That'd be really good. Yep. Yep. So we look forward to hearing from you. Yeah, that'd be brilliant. So... I think that's it for me. We'll yeah. see you and hear, hear from you next week. Yep. So we're back for episode 36. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks for listening and uh, see you on the next one. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye.